We're going to get started in about 30 seconds. Today's lesson 177, a summary of 163 and 164. There is no death. The Son of God is free. Now we are one with God, who is our source, and God is but love. Therefore, so am I. Good morning, everybody. Lesson 177, the summary of 163 and 164. There is no death. The Son of God is free. Lesson 164 is, now we are one with God, who is our source. And we're encapsulating everything in, God is but love, and therefore, so am I. <laughs> there is no death. The Son of God is free. God is but love, and therefore so am I. Now we are one with God, who is our source. God is but love, and therefore so am I. Our general instructions for these ten days of review have the same pattern. This lesson, 177, a review of 163 and 164, will begin and end each session with the theme behind this review lesson, which is, God is but love, and therefore, so am I. The central idea from 163 is, there is no death. The Son of God is free. Consider how this lesson clarifies and enhances the theme that God is but love, and therefore so am I. Next review, the central theme from lesson 164, which is, Now we are one with God, who is our source. How does this lesson clarify and enhance the theme that God is but love, and therefore so am I. Remember to end your session by repeating the general theme that God is but love, and therefore so am I. Throughout your day, remember the words, but go beyond the words. Share the experience of being that love, and you will create a great day for yourself and our world. I'm going to read the notes out of Lesson 163. Before you do, Lee, can you go back just to uh, one previous page? I just noticed something that I hadn't seen before today. One, Go back one more page. Another one. Until you get to the introduction here. There. This is the lesson. Okay. Right. Okay. There is no death. No. I know, but I know I need the first. I need the page of the review. Okay, Dad. Here you go. This is it. All right. Now we are one. Now we are one with God, who is our source. God is but love. And therefore, so am I. The therefore, remember we talked about the syllogism and it was kind of only two parts instead of three parts. You should to, define to the, the word syllogism I, for us I'm, all. I'm going to. Oh, okay. Um, I'm going to be quiet then. <laughs> that's ahead. okay. That's okay. I'm trying to find the, the, the reading. I mean, the specific... This, syllogism is... You know what? Let me... I, I, I need to go find it because it's in a footnote. I'm not sure where it is. Uh, please no continue with your stuff and I'll come back to this later. Thanks. Sure thing. No problem. Here in Lesson 163... We are going to read the notes. 
There's no death. The Son of God is free. Yesterday's lesson was, I am as God created me. Would God create something that would die? The real definition of death is not the death of the illusionary body. Instead, death is defined as any thought that claims you could be something you're not. Because of this unusual definition, death takes on many different forms in our ego, fear-based world. Death masquerades as sadness, fear, anxiety, lack of trust, and ultimately as the death of the body. When you claim you don't know what you are, you're claiming you're dead. You're living in fear. To live in fear is to be dead to the reality of God's love in the real world. Death is an embodiment of fear. Death is the host of sin, the god of guilt. Death proclaims itself as lord of all illusion. The deception of death is the only certainty in this world of time and space. Thus, death appears to have power over life itself. The death of our body is the ultimate witness that our ego's will is stronger than God's will. Death proves that the God of love has been killed by our ego's God of fear, and that the fear is real. Death is total, in that either all things die or all things live. There can be no compromise with death. Death either is or it is not. God did not create death, and therefore, death cannot be real. God created life, for life is creation and God's completion. Life is all that is real. The ego looks upon death as the only sure thing that we all must eventually endure. The ego holds up death to be our savior and proof that the ego's vision of our little s egoic self is correct. Death proclaims that God's will has been usurped by the ego's will and that God is dead. Unfortunately, you cannot believe that something dies without the belief that all die. If God's dead, your death is also inevitable, for death must be total with no exceptions. Death is the ego's proof that fear is both real and necessary for our daily survival. It justifies death, justifies our decision to follow the ego's fear-based thought system. To believe in death is to believe that God, the eternal, has somehow been changed by the ego. This erroneous, egoic belief has transformed a God of love into a God of judgment, wrath, and death. Yet this insane transformation is only imagined and cannot be real. Death is the real illusion. When you mistake the Son of God for the body, you have transformed the eternal into a symbol for death. We need to look past the illusion of death to the life that exists beyond the illusion. Death and life cannot both exist when you remember you are who when you remember who you are you can confidently declare that death not god is dead and tom has a couple of questions for us if you believed in death if you believed death is real can you believe that you remain as god created you 
These ideas are mutually exclusive. They can't both be correct. Another question. Can you see why death is the ego's ultimate proof that the ego's will is stronger than God's will? All right, Tom. Can't wait for your meditation today. Today, we're going to be doing this summary lesson, 177. The summary lesson says that there is no death. Well, the and actually, uh, the summary lesson key idea is God is but love, and therefore so am I. Uh, the lesson 163 is there is no death. The Son of God is free. Lesson 164, now we are one with God, who is our source. So today, we're going to go on a little exploration. And as we've already mentioned, the Course in Miracles says that time is a journey that is already over. The whole idea of separation is something that has already been completed. And now we're looking back and so what we're going to do today is we're going to look back on that journey. You are an individuated aspect of consciousness, part of the one self, indivisible. But in time and space, we appear to take on an autonomous form and seem to be separate. So you, as an inquisitive adventurer, that individuated aspect. We're gonna look back on that journey. So take a deep breath and just become aware of your essence, your spirit, and breathe in the energy, the life force into that essence and become aware of that spirit. Realize that you are not the game token that you call the body, that you are individuated consciousness. And where you choose to place your attention is where your thoughts will go. Thinking, as we mentioned in the last summary lesson was the idea of not knowing what you are. This lesson 163 defines death as this belief that you could be something other than as God created you, that you would, could not know or had forgotten what you really are. We think of death and time and space with the connection with the body. In that regard, birth is individuated consciousness coming into the awareness of a physical body and death is you, individuated consciousness, leaving that connection with that game token we call the body. Of course, you still exist as individuated consciousness. You no longer have a game token that will hold the space in this illusion, this play school of time and space. God is but love, and therefore, so am I. As we become aware of the breath and your essence, what we're going to do is we're going to place our attention on this body. And we're going to look at it and realize that today, this is the body that we're using and playing on this game board of time and space. But time is the belief that there is a past, a present, and a future. 
But as we've already learned through these lessons, we can place our awareness on any aspect of that timeline. So today, as an inquisitive adventure, I ask you to let's go back on that timeline. And in this case, what I'd like you to do is think of a time, perhaps in history, a time in the past, could be in the future, but it's probably easier to deal with the past that you're interested in. A time, perhaps in Earth history, not this lifetime, but some previous historical time that you recall that you seem to have an interest in. It could be the 1800s, it could be uh, World War II time, it could be anything. Just a time that you seem to have some affinity, some connection to. And what I want you to do is to select that time zone and let's move into that in time and form as a son of God, you're given the freedom to be or imagine anything that you want to experience. And today what I'd like you to do is to be or imagine a time that you've already selected in which you perhaps had a body. So imagine that you having a body in that time, whatever you've just chosen to explore today. You are an adventuresome aspect of that one self. And today we're gonna to kind of explore that old history, that old time when we had a different game token. And you can remember or imagine whatever you'd like. Do you see that body? Do you see that time? Imagine or remember that previous lifetime, that previous dream, that illusion that you were there playing on that game board and that you had a body which allowed you to communicate with other game tokens in that dimension of time and space. And just play with that for a moment and look back at that life. What was that lifetime designed to teach you? What did you want to learn from that time space continuum, that game? What was you there to learn and to demonstrate? And as you do that, let's take a moment to think of that time. What was the purpose? the goal of that lifetime. Take a moment and be in there and ask for some guidance. What was the purpose of that lifetime? Now, what I'd like you to do is to move forward in that lifetime. Proceed to when you've decided that you no longer wish to play on that dimension of time and space. That it's a time when you've decided that it's no longer worthwhile to expend the energy to maintain the game token, 
that we call the body, that the learning lessons have been absorbed or perhaps the learning lessons that can be gleaned by staying and playing on this game board is not worth the effort. That there could be a better utilization of your life force, of your essence, where you wish to place your awareness. And as you come to that realization, the realization that this game token is not what we truly are. It's just a communication device that holds a space on time and space on the game board of this time-space continuum that allows us to hone our skills and demonstrate as an adventure aspect of that oneself different aspects of love and freedom. And when we no longer choose to play the game, when the time and energy needed seems to be better spent elsewhere, we simply sever the civil silver cord that binds us to that body and we separate. And let's do that now. Let's cut that silver cord. And as we cut that, we lose the connection with that body. And as individuated consciousness, we see to leave the body. We might hover above it, looking at that game token that served us well. And let's say goodbye to that body. And let's leave that game board of time and space and place our attention on our surroundings. And let's become aware that there seems to be a light. Right? that we start moving towards our essence, starts gravitating, seeming to be pulled towards that light. And that light is a total acceptance of what we truly are. And as we move towards that light, we feel the un conditional love of God. That light, that oneness, total acceptance, no judgment, no incrimination, just open heart, accepting us, saying, child of God, you have completed Come back to me, my treasure. You are part of that one self. Thank you for completing that moment in time, that exploration for you, that individuated aspect through your exploration. I, the abstract one self, know the truth what I am. And as you move into that total acceptance and you start recalling what that life was for, that past life that you just left, you start looking and thinking, how did I do that? Was there some other learning lessons? Why was it my time? Why did I choose to leave the body? Why did I choose to say game of whatever that life was? It's time to leave. It's time to move on. And now as I look back that lifetime, 
and I recall what I came there to learn. I realize that I've advanced a ways down that supposed journey of remembering the truth of who I am, what I am, that I am love. And as I rest in that one, I start thinking of new learning lessons, or perhaps lessons that I don't really feel that I've totally absorbed, that I'd like to polish up and hone my skills a little bit more. I better demonstrate what love would have me do in a seeming world, a game board, in which there appears to be opposite that there could be something other than this total acceptance, this total oneness, that I want to not only be there, but I want to demonstrate what I, the principles that I've chosen to demonstrate, would do in a world that seemed to have so that I could hone my skill. And as we, that S, contemplate that, we, as an adventuresome soul, say, you know, I think I've learned some lessons. I think I could perhaps demonstrate, or there's something I want to demonstrate and make sure that I've learn that skill, that I can do that on the new game board of time and space. And that I'd like to maybe have a new adventure, a time when I could demonstrate to myself that I have determined principles that I choose to guide my journey, and I can demonstrate them in tough circumstances. And as you come to that realization that you'd like to continue on the adventure of reawakening and demonstrating and being love and hope, make a decision that you'd like to enter onto a new game board, a new dimension of time and space. Perhaps let's choose this lifetime. And now, to do that, though, we'll need a game token, a body, a placeholder that we can use to communicate to other individuated aspects that's chosen to play on that same game board that we've selected. That we need that game board. And there we explore that world. And we realize that there is a mother, there's a father somewhere out there that want to have the experience of being perhaps our parent for a moment in time on this game. And that at some point in time, you as individuated conscious make the decision to enter into and connect to a game token. Or we enter into the world and we actually connect to that game board. And we start connecting that silver cord to what will become our body, our neutral communication device that we'll need to communicate with and interact and hold a space on this new game board that we're going to call this time, this present moment. 
And as we now place our awareness back on our current state, this time, this space, this Game Boy, the time, June, this day, 2022, we start becoming aware of that game token, that body sitting there. Not what we are, but that connection to the body. We could, as we hover, uh, hover above our individuated consciousness, our essence, even though we're not the body, we can feel that connection. And let's just follow that silver cord back down into the game token we call that body. And let's reconnect. And we're, as we reconnect, let's remember what we wanted to demonstrate on this game board of time and space this time. What were the lessons we wanted to learn? What did we want to demonstrate? And realize that this game token is our neutral communication device that allows us to hone our skills and polish up those skills and demonstrate what love would have us do. There's just us, an explorer, learning lessons. And with these lessons, these day-to-day -day experiences, we gather the feedback to know how we're doing. No blame, shame, or guilt. Maybe the realization that today I felt that tomorrow I could perform a little better. That maybe I wasn't demonstrating what my belief about what I truly was. Maybe I didn't perform as well as I thought I could. No problem. It's just that awareness that I've learned something. And today I'm going to make some mid-course correction so that I can move along that time and fulfill my destiny. In time and space, our function is forgiveness. Our purpose is love. And our destiny is the peace of God. God is but love, and therefore, so am I. Now we are one with God, who is our soul. And when we re-enter that body, that game took, we seem to sometimes forget that. That God is our source. That we remain one with God. But today, as we look back on that journey of many, many lifetimes, and the game board that we call our now, we realize that there is only love. God is but love, and therefore, so am I. And as you reconnect with that body, that game token, that we need to hold that space, realize that Today, we've made a decision that there's still some learning lessons. There's still some demonstrations of love and form that we still desire to have future experiences that's going to hone our skill. And today, we're going to enjoy that journey of rediscovery, 
be awakening to the truth of what we are. And today, we're going to look with that vision of Christ, realize that there is no doubt. The Son of God is free. You are free to be or imagine anything you can. Today, we're going to play on the game floor that historically we might call planet Earth, year 2022. But now I am one with God, who is my source. God is but love, and therefore, so am I. And with that thought, that realization that you are that individuated aspect of the one self, but that you remain as God created, perfect, whole, and complete, part of the oneness of all that is, that today, we're going to go forth and create a fun, exciting experience for ourselves and create a great day for ourselves and our world. Today, we're going to utilize the vision of Christ. Today, we will not mistake the other game tokens, the actors, playing on this game board, we will remember the truth that there is no death. The Son of God is free, and we can be and imagine anything we want. Today, we make the choice to demonstrate what love would have me do. Today, we make the choice to learn to minimize, control, and eliminate our fear so that we can ask for God. Say, Holy Spirit, higher self, the God in me, what would love have me do? And demonstrate that. And with that thought and that decision to demonstrate being love and form. Your function is forgiven. Your purpose is love. Your destiny is the peace of God. Take a deep breath. And let's just run a little microcosmic orbit through that game token we call the body, reconnecting, bringing energy up through the soles of the feet, up front, through the back of the spine, up over the crown chakra, down the back of the leg, the sole of the feet, and let's send a energy lightning bolt back down, regrounding ourselves on this game board of time and space. The year, June, today's date, 2022. Reconnect. And when you feel grounded and willing to continue as that adventuresome aspect of that oneself, take a deep breath and connect back to the room, realizing that you are God's treasure. God is but love, and therefore, so am I. Namaste, the God in me recognizes the God in you. Create a great day for your world and yourself. Namaste. Thank you, Tom. Wonderful. I hope everybody's setting themselves up for a great day. I sure am. Lesson 177, the great one. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today. Today we read our lessons and make a great day. 
How's everybody doing today? Hey, everybody. <coughs> um, during the meditation, <clears throat> at the beginning, Tom had said to go anywhere we wanted to go at any time we wanted to go. <laughs> and I just by chance happened to pick this lifetime in the past um, when I was first meeting my husband. And it was a wonderful experience to be there again. But then I got pulled swiftly out of it when you told me to cut the silver cord to this lifetime. <laughs> and I was so like, cool. oh, no, no, I can't do that. <laughs> I just thought I'd share that was funny. <laughs> so I didn't do that. <laughs> I didn't cut the silver cord. And I, I wasn't in a meditation anymore because I got pulled out. And um, I was just listening um, to the transitions that you went through. Um, I do that very similar type of transition in my hypnosis therapy, um, except we stay a little bit longer. Um, <laughs> it felt a bit rushed, <laughs> like it, it went by too fast. I didn't have the chance to, uh, to fully conceptualize what it was you were saying. So uh, maybe just a suggestion to, to slow down and not rush through. And at the end, when we come back to our body, it happens in a flash. So the end can be shortened, um, but the the actual journey should be lengthened. So I just thought I'd add that as well, since I do it regularly. Um, but yeah, the ending and the coming out of back to the body, it's, it doesn't need to be so long. It happens pretty fast. But the journey through the other time um, needs to be lengthened because it felt really it felt really short and I didn't get the chance to conceptualize the vision of that time and space as much as I would have liked to. It was kind of brief. It was really jump in, jump out, and then a really long return to the body. <laughs> so I just thought maybe that would be helpful notes for you. But anyways, I did, I very much enjoyed being, I very much enjoyed being in the past when I met my husband though. So that was great. Thank you. That's great. I love that. Um, before Tom started the, uh, the exercise of breathing and, and uh, getting down level into this or up level, depending upon which way you're looking, um, I mentioned something about a syllogism, and Lee asked for the definition, and I it was it's actually in the purple book footnotes somewhere, but I was not able to find it and. and quickly enough, so I just went with Tom, and I know it's in there. However, um, it, it's an interesting thing, and it, it's very useful here, and I read about it a couple of days ago, and I wanted to bring it up, so here's what a syllogism is. Um, it's basically an argument, and it has three parts to it. The first part says, if A, whatever that is, is true, the second part says, and B is true, then using deductive reasoning, we know for a fact that C is true. It's just the way it works. If, if Lee is my son and I am his father, therefore, we are in the same family, for, as an example. It, there, there's no way to to, to mess up that particular argument. It's de by definition. I'm sorry, can you say again the three parts? I mean, it's uh, one sure. is true, the, so other, the other one. And I'm going to give you an example. If if Lee is my son. No, yeah, I, I, I did hear the, oh. the, the example, but I still need to have the three parts again in my mind for a, for a reason that I will tell well, you that. Basically, if A oh. is true and B is true, then or therefore C is true. So when we start to read this particular set of review lessons, we have the same statement in each one. That was not always the case in the past. It's something new. And so um, lesson 171, for example, said, it said, all things are echoes of the voice of God. And then we would read, God is but love, and therefore so am I. Here's the clue. When you see the word therefore, 
it implies something, but we don't know what it is unless we put it together. So it's, it's a little confusing. It's not a big deal. But here's the way you would read the first one. God is but love. That's A. B is the lesson. All things are echoes of the voice of God. And then C is the second half of their repetition. And therefore, so am I. So God is but love. All things are echoes of the voice of God. Therefore, so am I. Or lesson 152, um, the original. God is but love. The power of decision is my own. And therefore, so am I. In this case, you know, the words themselves aren't, aren't perfectly uh, organized, but the idea is important because it gives us, when we read through it that way, we get a different sense than we would get otherwise. Um, the, actually, the next one, 153, God is but love. In my defenselessness, my safety lies. And therefore, so am I. God is but love. I am among the ministers of God. Then, therefore, so am I. And it, it, what it does is it, it recreates God is but love, and therefore, so am I. Right now, this may sound much more educational or that kind of stuff, but in some of these particular lessons, and the one that we did today, um, it works very well in the second one. So I'll read that. God is but love. Now are we one with him who is our source. And then back to the original meaning of the first statement. God is but love and therefore so am I. Because God is our source and we're one with him. It's just proving the point and therefore so am I. So it's the, the reason I bring it up is um, it, it, it's, it re-slants the way we look. It gives us a slightly different point of view. We're looking at, um, we are the viewpoint, and we are moving in a slightly different position so that we get the full meaning of the lesson in the original words. Um, the game token that we are is... A communication device and it's on a game board of life therefore the game token is on a game board of life it the example um, keeps on going and if you like to play with words some of us do some of us don't if you don't ignore everything I just said if you do it's kind of fun to look at it um, always God is but love is the first attention. Then the lesson is the second attention. And then the third, which is the second half of the statement, and therefore so am I, God is but love, and therefore so am I. That becomes the, I think I've overdone it already. So yeah, I yeah. Play, I was, anyone who wants to play with that, they can I play was, I was, I, I was going to just add, or not add, but like complement, complement the, the, the thing that you're saying is because everything is a trinity in fact everything is a trinity so yeah if yeah. there's a father if if there's the, if there is a father there has to be a son in order for the father to be the father so if there's a father there's a son but as we are not this body then there has to be a holy spirit so when there's a father, there's a son, and therefore there's the Holy Spirit too. And in the sentence of uh, of the of the main uh, learning from this review, that God is but love, but there, and therefore so am I. You have God as a true love, as another true, and therefore I am. So everything is a trinity. You might not be looking at yourself as the father because probably you're in a, in a stage in your life that you're the son you're feeling like the son but as the as the lesson ends up being in i am that means that the son is the father 
and the Father and the Son are the Holy Spirit as well. So everything is a trinity. It doesn't matter where you look at it. It's a triangle. You can place the triangle pointing up or pointing down. It will be still a triangle. You can see yourself as a relationship between, between Father and Son, and that will end up being the Holy Spirit, or you can see the Holy Spirit being like a father or a son, and it will be the same thing. It's part of the same source. So yeah, it's a good, it's a good, uh, yeah, it's a good thing that you have explained to me. That how is the word of that concept? The name? Of the syllogism. Concept? Syllogism. syllogism. Yeah, everything is a trinity. Yeah. yeah. A, a syllogism. It is a form of logic. It basically has mm -hmm. a typically a major premise, a minor premise, and uh, then it has a conclusion, which is the therefore. The uh, important thing about a syllogism is that if the major and minor, the, the premises are true, the conclusion must also be true. Yeah. And so if you accept the major and the, the premises that came before, then it becomes logical and it is deemed to automatically be true. So what's important here in this and in, in the, the workbook lessons, we've probably we've already passed this about the idea of what a syllogism is and, and a uh, if you know an example is like, uh, all men are human, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates must be human. Uh, they, if, if we accept those major and minor premises, the conclusion must be right. And what's important here is the thought system that we're uh, coming out of, a fear-based thought system has a major and minor premise and if we assume, for example, uh, I am a sinner, or, or, it, or, or, you know, if we say I am a sinner, then the, the uh, conclusion or that I am not separate, I lack, what we're going to do if we accept those major and minor premises, the conclusion will always still leave us in fear. So what we have to be aware of is just because something's in a syllogism form of A is therefore, uh, you know, A and B are true, therefore C, the ego will argue that C is correct. What we have to do in our reawakening is question the egoic principle, the major premise that I am a body and the body is me. If we refuse to question that major, the validity of that first statement, we will be trapped in fear. So a syllogism, it's important to realize that the therefore is logical and has to be correct if we accept those original premises. So in order to reawaken to the truth of what we are, we have to question the validity of those major and minor premises. And when we reject the idea that I am a body and the body is me, only then will we be able to escape fear within and have the logic behind it to support it. So if God is only love and God created me, therefore, if I must be love, like begets like. God is only love, like begets like. God created me, therefore, I must be love. These are premises, and if those are true, the conclusion is true. If I say that, God did not create me perfect, whole, and complete. And we make that assumption, we're going to be in fear. If I, and you probably notice, I always harp on the idea that we're perfect, whole, and complete. 
I come from that premises, that major premise that God created me like himself, which is what the Chorus says. Therefore, I must be part of that oneness. I must be perfect, whole, and complete. It's a, it's a logical sequence. If I jump into the fear-based thought system, what I do is I take a premise that I refuse to question like, I am a sinner. And then from that premise, because I've introduced a flaw in uh, and uh, have an embedded assumption in that premise, I am a sinner. Uh, that's where we have to attack the premise. We have to say, no, that premise, that syllogism follows logically, but I don't accept your major or minor premise. I say one of those two premises are false. It's not true that I am a sinner. It's not true that God didn't create me perfect, whole, and complete. Not true that God is uh, not unconditional love. And when we start attacking or questioning those premises, then we have the overthrow of the fear-based thought system. So it's very important we understand that if we accept one of the premises of a fear-based thought system, the conclusion that we draw, which I is I am, uh, I lack something, that conclusion is not correct because one of those premises that we based it on was faulty. It wasn't true. So syllogism, if the premises are true, the therefore has to be true. So we have to realize that when someone says you are the body and the body is you, if you accept that, you're trapped in fear. So what you have to do is you have to say, no, that premise that you said, I am the body. No, I'm not the body. I am a essence. I am individuated conscious. I exist with or without the body now because we've questioned that syllogism's premise and says, I reject that A, B, therefore C. I reject one of those two uh, premises that you have. Now the conclusion does not have to be correct. It could be. It, it could be. We could have a syllogism like this. Yeah, exactly. Um, Separation idea creates fear. Therefore, you see bodies. Yeah. It is everything have... is a trinity. Yeah, you have you, you you get to choose what kind of trinity you you want to experience in right. life. What is what you're truly yeah. looking for in this experience? Yeah, yeah. You, you could say everything's a trinity, but everything's based on these promises. So, like, if I said uh, all birds have feathers, a cow is a bird, therefore a cow has feathers. That is a logical syllogism. And it is correct in form. There, there's a, a thing between uh, it being form and being true. So it's a logical syllogism. And it's true that cows must have feathers if both of those two premises are correct. But if it's not true that a cow is a bird, then the conclusion that a cow has feathers is not necessarily true. It might be. It might be a coincidence that it does, but in this case, we can't draw that conclusion. But if a uh, we said all birds have feathers, a, a robin is a bird, a robin must have feathers, that would be correct. So we just want you to be aware that a syllogism is a, a logical, uh, a form of reasoning that will give you the correct answer only if the premises that it's based on is true. If the syllogism, the syllogism of will come theory. at the end at one. I mean, the syllogism that it's a trinity will at, at the end will confirm one thing, one. Uh, it, it, you know, you, you so, use the word trilogy. So there, you, there could be 
a, a syllogism. Will confirm what I'm. A lot of different premises. And it's, it's a logical. And, it's a logical concept. So we'll end up yeah. being at one. So what what I was trying to say with this is that as everything will end up being one, as the analogy with the Father and Son, therefore the Holy Spirit or God is but love, therefore, so I, I'm a, I am or am I. Um, yeah, it, so if, if you, you if get you to God have... Love, if you say God is only love, God created me, uh, yeah. therefore, that, that, that means that's logical. Yeah. You know, but yeah, you but could see, have, and a lot of but times... See, but, but see how in duality really this is... Yeah. yeah, yeah, the syllogism in duality can also can also be negative because if you mind things that everything is apart that you are not belonging to the source, then there's the tiny mind idea. The tiny mind idea will give you fear, and therefore you will believe that you are the body. <laughs> so, okay, it's, it's, I introduced everything I introduced will come the, to a one a yeah. one to a to the oneness concept. So the thing is, you get to decide what is the oneness that you want to experience in life you want to experience the life in fear thinking that you're the body or you want to experience the life in the concept that you are love that That's you have the just... love that you want to have well, here's an example me... of the syllogism i am separate or i am the body the body is separate therefore or the body dies therefore i die those are logical syllogisms the question, if you want to escape fear, is are those premises right? Am I the body? Uh, does the body die? The, yes, the body does die. Now the question is, am I a body? If I'm not a body, then the idea that I must die no longer is true. If So, so that's that the important thing. We have to become aware that in our fear-based thought system, in our world, we've been indoctrinated into believing premises that we never question. We're told we're a worthless piece of shit. That becomes the premise from which you base all your other logical conclusions until you're willing to question the validity of the first of, of that premise. I'm a worthless piece of shit you will always come out being a worthless piece of shit. So what we want to do is become aware of the power of a syllogism and realize that if we don't like the conclusion that the syllogism gets us, we have to examine those uh, premises and say, are those true? Is the idea that God would create a worthless piece of shit. Correct. Is those right or wrong? If I start questioning those premises, then I can say, hold it, wait, your flaw in the logic that I'm a worthless piece of shit isn't correct because that earlier statement is not true. So that's the important once you get trapped into the embedded assumption, and then whenever we talk, we often, and, and I, I listen to people talking, and I hear embedded assumptions that I don't assume. You know, they assume that they're the body and the body is them. Uh, once they've made that assumption, their conclusion is based on logic. The, and the only way you can overcome or question that is by i don't want to i use the word attacking or questioning the truth of the premises that they're assuming because those uh things are normally assumptions rather than proven facts if you look at geometry if you look at logic one of the things that they often spend their time a proof is proving that one of those premises is actually true so that you can rely on it in the future. You know, in geometry, you know, the lines are parallel to two points, you know, and, and all these things. So they spend a lot of time trying to come up with premises, things that they've already proven to be correct and build off those so that they can move further and further and draw more and more conclusions. So the, the only thing, 
in this world, okay, the our society, for example, our society might say God is dead. Okay, there is no God. If you come out of that belief and you refuse to question it or you refuse to uh, question your spiritual essence, they say that the body is you, you are trapped because logically they will always be able to keep you in fear. The only way to escape fear is to question the basic premises that the fear-based thought system is built around. I, I introduced this thing and, and we've had a, a, a wonderful big discussion about it, but let me tell you why I introduced it. My wife, Susie, um, she has had a different kind of faith in God than I have. And I have been trying to find things to say, what can I offer that might help and so on. And the re there's a reason for it though. And it's one of those premises, Tom, that was um, false. And here's how that worked. And by the way, a triangle is the strongest shape and it's the simplest shape in the universe. Uh, uh, but, but remember, Adriana, that there can be two or three or four supporting premises. So it's not always a triangle, it could be a hexagon, <laughs> but that's irrelevant. Now, the point I wanna make here is when, when Susie was a little girl, her grandmother was very sick and she would watch Oral Roberts, who was a um, very famous, well-known, um, uh, evangelist on TV at those in those days and he would say and Susie would hear if you the listener touch the TV then you would be healed now, that's what Susie heard there's a couple of things in that particular premise that may or may not be true but until someone questions Let's assume, well, the second event that I want to compare that to is someone else who just told me this the other day, that they were healed. They had a, a physical problem. They were listening to Oral Roberts who said, you can be healed. I don't know if he had said about the TV at the time. It wasn't there. But she did get healed. Now, if I tell that to Susie, is that going to convince her of anything? Maybe. That... She heard one thing, but that's not what was said. Or maybe that what Oral Roberts said back then, he knew that he could bring people to Jesus in that case, but he used the TV and touching the TV as a, as, as a specific premise, which could be easily misproven. And it, that's what happened. And it ended up that she passed away eventually. Um, of course, everybody passes away eventually. So the whole idea of, is, to, is to question our premises. And that's what Tom is saying. And I, um, in that particular case, it set Susie on a pathway of just not believing anything someone like Oral Roberts says. She came up with that. In other words, if a person could touch the if a person touches the TV thinking that Oral Roberts through the TV can heal them and that person doesn't get healed, then their conclusion is this doesn't work at all. There is no way to be healed by faith. And that can set a person on a pathway for a whole lifetime that denies them the ability to understand where faith is, where it comes from, and how it can work. That's the purpose of this book, is to get the premises to any statement or thought that we have correct. So it starts with a basic, God is but love. That's a statement they make in the book. It's now, we could consider it an axiom like we did in geometry, for those of you who didn't sleep through that. So if that's true, then we can build other conclusions based upon that truth.
That's the whole idea here, is to come up with some basic, simple truths. And there's a lot of them in this book. And if you work with those premises, you will come to some very good and creative solutions. We all want to be healed. Okay, what do we need to think in order to be healed? The book explains that. We all want to love and be loved. What do we do? And the book explains that. That's how we can get to the conclusions we personally want in life. I want to be loved. I want to be able to love anybody. Any of those conclusions are based upon basic premises that are in this book. So that was my intention, not to give a whole lesson on syllogisms, but and Tom knows uh, more of the details of it, frankly. Um, but it was so if you say so what? Well, I'm saying this is why we look at these very simple statements. God is but love. And therefore, so am I. Anything you want to put after God is but love, like there is no death, we are one with him. Let my mind, let not my mind deny God. Any of those you put in, it still stands strongly. And if I still have confused anybody, I apologize. End of discussion for today, <laughs> of that discussion. I, I think that we made some good points and I hope everybody got something from it. Thanks. Yeah, I just wanted to say a good example of a syllogism or beginning of a syllogism. Like I was born and raised a Catholic. Uh, you were born in original sin, except that, and you've got major problems with the idea that God is only love or that, um, you know, that God is not something to fear. You know, that God created you perfect, whole and complete. So these basic, and, and it's interesting, Bob mentioned the word axiom. Axioms are statements that we assume to be correct. We don't necessarily have to prove them. We just assume that they're correct. The idea that I am born in the original sin is an axiom for the Catholics that's just assumed to be correct, but it leaves them in a state of constant fear. It makes them an earner and makes their God of supposed unconditional love into a God of judgment and wrath. So, um, you know, just be aware, question assumptions. Very good point. Are those true? Tom, that's so important because if, I mean, take the, what's going on in, in the Supreme Court. I'm not going to get into it, but I'm just going to say a person who has assumed the basic premise that God created the Catholic idea of when the person became a person, when the embryo became a person and so on, if they believe that absolutely, then an abortion is killing. But what if that's not exactly true? What if it's 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 partially true? That's where we can have wars of groups of people against others because of certain assumptions. It's the assumptions that create wars. One of the two points is true, perhaps, and one of them is not. Therefore, your final conclusion would be wrong. And that's where, that's how we stop bickering with people. If we bicker all the time, then something is assumed in the mind of at least one of the two people, if not both, that is incorrect. And it means everything that comes out of that discussion or in that relationship is going to be a very difficult relationship. If a, if a person had a parent, a pair of parents, two parents, <laughs> mother and father, who fought with each other all the time, threw dishes at each other, broke dishes or whatever, that's what parents do, that, that child thought, and that person goes to marry someone else, they're going to lock up their cabinets and make sure nobody can get to the dishes because parents break dishes. 
they came up with that conclusion based upon perhaps one or two premises that weren't correct. And this is how marriages fail. This is how enemies are made with the differences of opinions based on faulty premises. And this book gives us premises we can count on. Can I, can I Absolutely. jump in into this? I am okay. complete. Okay, we are agreeing that the only truth is love, that we know, right? That it's for sure because we are students of A Course in Miracles and we are deeply understanding the concept of this uh, new perception in life, in this life. We are understanding that we are living in this, in this duality, but we are not from this duality. We are from the light. That is for short for us. And when you have the experience with this kind of tools in your hand, what I was trying, what I was trying to to call, like to bring into the discussion is that one's mind can, I mean, a truth is as true as one's mind wants to believe it. So if a person, for example, in the syllogism that we were thinking uh, uh, in the in the negative aspect aspect of of, of perception. Uh, let's up to have uh, as a truth uh, that you are the body. Of course, you will have those experiences in life. So, uh, all senses we are we are right now talking and experiencing each other in a conversation through our senses. Our body is just a, a, a mechanism, a, com a communication mechanism, right? And our senses go outwards, I mean, opens outwards. So you think that the light is outside because your senses seems to go outside and search for the light that is the sun and everything that you see in duality. What I think, of course, in middle course, has been teaching me is to understand that that is, that is a... A mechanism that in my perception that in my perception needs to be reversed because even if my senses perceive the light outside the light is within me who is the searcher that is inside of me looking for good experiences in life who is that is not the body the body is giving me information who is what is inside of me that is trying to grasp experiences in duality that gives me pleasure or peace or 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 yeah all the good concepts that we know in the world so the syllogism is just another logical concept that can be used for the ego purpose or for the holy spirit purpose Everything comes at one. The mathematics, the numbers needs to be excused and forgive, forgive the numbers because all the numbers things that they have another kind of true different than one, but all the numbers in the mathematics will end up showing one single concept. If you have one triangle, it's one triangle with, you can add as many points in this concept that you want and it will still be one shape you will make one shape so all the numbers all the mathematics will lead up to a conclusion again you can see that conclusion with the means of the ego or with the means of the holy spirit because astrologism is just an aspect with i mean a, a thing with three aspects of one true so as we are living our lives through our bodies and our body senses opens outwards we are constantly trying to look the light or for or searching the light outside ourselves and what the course in miracles it's trying or or for example in my experience with the course in miracles what i have been learning is that i need to just dismiss forgive my own perception of the level of the form and just close my eyes, close my ears, close my mouth, and shut 
everything up for a second just to try to see who is inside of me searching for something and what is that giving me a bad experience or a good experience so if i close my eyes and i shut my mouth and i hear and i see and i know that i can see whatever my mind just reverse that experience with light because light is in everything and the inner eye starts to get a little bit more comfortable in darkness because in that darkness is yourself like trying to show you that whatever it is you're searching for is not outside it's inside of you what is the light that you are looking for outside if it is inside if you quiet your mind if you quiet your experience with logic with numbers with feeling sensation attachment to things to um, being successful in this world what is left inside of you it's calm it's peaceful there's nothing and in nothingness there's the whole world inside of you in the nothingness you can feel at peace because you don't have attachment in the darkness that is within yourself that you think that it's bad your eyes if you shut your eyes a little bit the ones that you have in your physical body and you go with your mind inside of you you will see neutral you will see neutral and you will see that you can have the ability to imagine what past lives you had imagine what future lives you can have all the universe is within us and we decide which kind of experience we can see as the same analogy with the syllogism a syllogism is just a trinity you decide which trinity you you want to see father son and holy spirit or separation idea fear and a body <laughs> you decide so i wanted to finish my participation today with that because the concept of one is something that we need to reflect more deeply inside of us because we are truly one we are truly the father the son that therefore we are holy spirit we are so the spirit we are not the body so oh, i don't know i feel really like this course has given me such a, such an experience of inspiration to to reverse the way i perceive the world with my senses. I know that my senses gives me the experience of God in the level of the form, but it's because now my mind, it's understanding that God has been always there. So, oh, I hope this helps to get into a conclusion because everything has been good. I mean, this entire discussion has been so enlightening for me. So I'm really enjoying to have you both uh, every morning having those conversations thank you everybody and if I, anybody wants to jump in to say something else please raise your hands i have been sending invitations but i know that it's very early in the morning so i hope you everybody have a beautiful sunday i'm having a good one here If we're not having a good time in life, the basic lesson that this discussion is, is to verify your premises. Look inside, think about what you're absolutely sure of, and see and ask. You can always ask yourself, which is another way of saying you can ask the Holy Spirit, which we assume who take this course, that there is a Holy Spirit in us. That is an axiom for some of us, but only an assumption for some of us. But if we keep asking for an answer and we find an answer, it becomes a definite axiom for us. It's something we absolutely accept as truth. So we ask for clarification. We ask for 
what do I do now? This thought contradicts this other thought I've always had. Therefore, if I'm going to analyze that, one of those two must be wrong. Ask for it. Sometimes when I've done that, I find it in tomorrow's reading when I get there. I have to ask for it if I'm confused. And we always get an answer. I always get an answer. I say I always, all right? That's not 100% true because I may not get an answer right now. If And if time, if my request is, please tell me what I don't understand here now. I need it to know in the next hour. And if you don't get that answer, you may think, oh, well, so much for that. That doesn't work. Well, the, one of the parts of that premise was wrong, that we could ask for it and insist upon when we get the answer. It, it, at first glance, because of the way Tom and I both discussed it, and Adriana, the three of us, um, there are apparent See, weaknesses. See, there's a trinity there. <laughs> well, there, there, it is a trinity because there are three people, yes. And the three people each have assumptions as to how many of the points are true. I, I think that we all do agree axiomatically <laughs> on certain parts of it. And, and I'm, I'm adding these words. Some people like these kinds of symbols and that it enables them to abstract what's going on. And then when they get an answer, come back and make it specific to what's going on. Um, if these things interest you, You'll use them in your meditation, and you may discover some interesting things about the way you think, where your beliefs come from, and to clarify many of your beliefs. If we do clarify them, even if they're true or not, if we clarify them, then we have made a lot of progress towards the truth, because ultimately, as Adriana keeps bringing us back to, there is only one truth that matters. God is truth. Now, as soon as I say God is love or God is light, I can say all those things, and they also can be true. And if I had the vision of God, then I would see that all those things are true. For the time being, I'm going to accept them because they work for all the other logical issues that I try to perceive. We can easily go around and around in circles, but the, the reason for all this is to clarify what we're meditating about and to take the time to challenge our assumptions. If a person keeps getting fired from every job he has, his assumption may be, well, I'm, I'm a worthless piece of crap, as Tom said, something like that. But if he's getting fired from every job he, he gets, there may be 15 reasons. And the first job is reason one, second job is reason two, third job is reason three. So the fact that that does not prove because he's been fired from every job that he's going to be fired from the job he has now. That was the assumption he came up with. But that's probably because he didn't analyze or she didn't analyze what were the reasons that I really got fired or my marriage didn't work or my marriage did work or whatever that turns out to be. So it's very wide ranging. It's a game in a sense, like the whole game board that Tom talks about, because that's what we are while we're in our bodies on this earth. We're on a game board. And it's nice to win when you're on a game board. But you don't have to always win. There's an assumption that can start wars. Okay, I think we've probably had enough discussion about those kinds of things. Perhaps it helps one person here who might be saying, well, what do you do when you drop level or you, you go into a new place? You, I just fall asleep. Therefore, meditation is useless unless I need some rest. <laughs> It, 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 you can play this game over and over, but there are advantages to understanding at least that some of our premises may be not correct. And I can tell you that 
the people on this stage here and many of us who have come and hundreds of thousands who have studied it believe these premises and that's what this book is about and the Bible has other premises and other spiritual books have other premises many are similar and enough said I really am complete on this one <laughs> so I'm going to let it go and um, turn it back to Lee to set reset and tell us where we're going what's next and so I'm going nowhere but up everything's awesome okay. everything is wonderful <laughs> <laughs> Today was lesson 177, a summary of 163 and 4. 163 was, there's no death, the Son of God is free. God is but love, therefore so am I. Now we're one with God, who is our source. I really appreciate you guys being with me. And we'll be here tomorrow to read 178. <laughs> Well, thank you, everybody. I really enjoyed it. Uh, it's more than blessing. And have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. See you tomorrow.